pitching for the Mets this evening in this historic meeting. Dave Malicki, two and five on the year of 4.70 ERA. And for the Yankees, he was runner up in the Cy Young Award last year. Andy Pettit, the left hander, eight and three, an excellent 3.14 ERA. The New York Mets have been here before, but never in an occasion where the game has counted. Well, folks, tonight it does at Yankee Stadium. The New York Mets and the New York Yankees. Hello, everybody. I'm Gary Thorne, along with Tim McCarver. After 103 meetings that didn't matter a damn, this one counts. Does it ever? The last game, however, that two New York teams played here in New York was back in the Polo Grounds on September 8, 1957. That's 40 years ago when the Brooklyn Dodgers lost to the New York Giants for the last time at the Polo Grounds, the losing pitcher. Interestingly, in that game for the Dodgers, Don Drysdale. Timmy, there are interleague games, and then there is the New York interleague game. The Subway Series tonight is for real. The National Anthem at Yankee Stadium. And earlier this afternoon, Ralph Kiner, a monument in this game himself, visited some other monuments that you may have heard about. Thanks, Gary. I'm standing here in Monument Park in center field at Yankee Stadium. Tradition is the most important thing in baseball. When I first played here in Yankee Stadium in 1955, I thought of the great players that have played here, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, and many others. Yankee Stadium was built in 1923, a year after I was born. It has become so traditional that you always think of the 60th home run that Babe Ruth hit, the 61st home run that Roger Maris hit, the 56th game hitting streak of Joe DiMaggio, and also that inspirational speech by Lou Gehrig on his retirement. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Besides the great players we have mentioned before, there are other great Yankee players honored here in Monument Park. There is a monument to Mickey Mantle, also a plaque to Yogi Berra, and another great tradition starting up tonight, the Mets against the Yankees in interleague play. Now to Gary Thorne, and Tim McCarver. Ralph, thanks very much. That is the great monument park that used to be part of the playing field here at Yankee Stadium until the reconstruction took place. Now it is on the other side of the fence. Here are the two managers for tonight's game, Joe Torrey of the world champion New York Yankees and Bobby Valentine in his first full season as a New York Met skipper and both of them willingly admitting tonight, yes, we are excited even though we've been in some big games tonight. The adrenaline's pumping. Andy Pettit will get to throw the first pitch. The 25-year-old left-hander, 21 wins last year, taking on the New York Mets with an 8-3 mark. And the Mets lineup is brought to you by your Tri-State Quality Ford dealer. Leading off for the Mets, just off the disabled list, Lance Johnson, followed by Bernard Gilkey and John Olerud. Clean up, Todd Hunley, the catcher. The designated hitter, Butch Husky. Carl Everett's been red hot. He's the right fielder. Carlos Baerga at second base, batting seventh. Matt Franco at third, hitting eighth. And Luis Lopez, the shortstop, batting ninth. The defensive alignment in this game. Behind Andy Pettit for the Yankees. Mark Witten, Chad Curtis, and Paul O'Neill will be in the outfield. Charlie Hayes will make the start at third rather than Boggs tonight. Derek Jeter, Pat Kelly, and uh, Tino Martinez at first. Joe Girardi will be doing the catching the battery mate of Andy Pettit. Full house, of course, on hand here at Yankee Stadium for tonight's game. It is a magnificent evening. Just could not be nicer. Beautiful day here in the New York area today, and what a great night for baseball. I got to tell you, Gary Thorne, it is a privilege for me to be here with you. Tim McCarver, I and I know Ralph feel the same. Interleague play, it counts. Andy Pettit's first pitch is down low, and this monumental series is underway. Lance Johnson coming off the uh, DL since May 2nd, and it was retroactive when he was put on on the third. Johnson grounding towards short. Jeter over to get it. Double clutches, makes the play, and that will retire the Mets' leadoff batter, Lance Johnson. And a one down. As Derek Jeter, the rookie of the year, the shortstop, comes up with a play on Johnson with the shin splints, happy to be back in action for the Mets. Jeter not having a sophomore slump, and certainly no slump for this veteran, Andy Pettit. Just having another 
magnificent season. Left-hander, Mets are 11 and 7 against left-handed starters this year. Bernard Gilkey, check swing, he's got a base hit to right field. Over to get it, O'Neill. He's on his way to second base, and it'll be a stand-up double. And the first hit in an interleague game between the Yankees and Mets goes to Bernard Gilkey. In poker, there is a saying that the check is at the station. In this game, the check is at Yankee Stadium. Check swing down the right field line, and Bernard Gilkey, with his 11th double of the season, is in scoring position for New York. So he gets the base hit, the double, 11th of the season, coming off Andy Pettit, and now John Olerud, second in the National League. In average with runners in scoring position at 441 gets a chance. And Petty with a fastball strike. I guess that's the first flub of the night. I said in scoring position for New York. Anybody on second or third tonight would be in scoring position for New York. So it can't be a flub. Oh, it's an well, all it's always true. right. It's universally correct. Universally correct in this game. <laughs> Anytime you use New York in front of, you're all set. All a road waiting and the 0 1 delivery to him and the breaking ball misses outside. Andy Pettit, a pronounced ground ball pitcher, fourth highest ground ball ratio in the American League last year. So when he's on, you'll see the ground balls. John Olerud and Carlos Baerga in this lineup have faced Andy Pettit since they are two Mets who have played in the American League. You saw the numbers one for eight for Olerud against him. And the off speed pitch just missed inside. Two ball, one strike count did not go around, says Mike Everett, third base umpire. Interesting thing about Andy Pettit most left handed pitchers are much, much better against left handed hitters. Not so Andy Pettit. Left handed batters hit 329 last year and a robust 375 against him this year. Why, Timmy? I, I don't know. I think. I mean that's something you would never see a right handed pitcher against a right handed batter. I think it's the very fact that Andy Pettit doesn't have a left handed pitch that moves in to a left handed batter. He can't neutralize the left hander for the most part everything's away to left handers. Runner at second at a three one count. Jeter jockeying at second base with Gilkey jammed him and he's got a base hit down the line. Bernard Gilkey makes the turn. The Mets go on top, one nothing, and John Olerud continues his spectacular hitting when he's got a chance to pick up an RBI. And yes, you can tell there are Met fans at Yankee Stadium. And the interesting thing about that pitch, it was what we were talking about. It was a fastball inside, but it didn't bite inside. It's straight. Girardi is outside. The pitch is inside. And that is always a mistake. And Olerud gets it by Tino Martinez at first. 47 RBIs now for John Olerud. And the Mets go on top, getting to Andy Pettit here in the first inning. Olerud on at second base now has 19 doubles on the year to go along with those 47 runs batted in. Gilkey the first to score the run. The first RBI goes to John Olerud. Todd Hundley and he takes the pitch inside. One ball one strike on Hundley. Andy Pettit has been the go to guy two consecutive years now for the Yankees. They are nine and five in his starts. He's also the guy who comes back after they've lost a game to get him out of a losing streak or prevent one from happening. He's trying to do that again here as the Yankees played in Florida. Joe Torre said before the game tonight the trip from hell because it rained <laughs> and it rained some more. They got the games in and the Marlins won two of the three but it wasn't easy trip from Noah's Ark. Yeah they spent the entire three days literally at the ballpark. Todd Hudley with a 2 1 from Andy Pettit, and that's away, and the count goes to three balls and one strike. And Butch Husky will be re entering the lineup as the designated hitter for the New York Mets in tonight's game, and he'll be batting in the five spot. Olerud on at second base gets a good lead. They don't try and hold him close. 3 1 the count. And he rips it foul, jumped out in front of that one. This is not obviously Todd's power side. 
as he has 15 home runs 14 of those hit from the other side of the plate. And Gary the one thing that Andy Pettit has done this year compared to last year he's come up with a circle change that he throws in situations just like this first base open if he misses with it it'll be low and away to Hunley. Todd slightly open on the stance against Pettit 3 2 delivery to him and he missed outside with a changeup. and Andy Pettit who does not walk many 30 in 100 innings has given up one here and is having a tough start. Hey, the one impressive thing about the Yankee catcher Joe Girardi and you folks I'm certain you saw it last year he sets up late he doesn't give the runner at second base a chance to give location to the hitter and sure enough it was a change up low and away and Hunley walks with first base open but that's one of those unintentional intentional deals right there. And now we'll see the big change that's been so much talked about in these interleague games that somewhat changes the complexion of the games obviously the pitchers aren't hitting when the games are being played in the American League parks with the American League designated hitter rule being in effect. So with Todd Hundley on the 36 walks and 41 games for him he is third in the National League in walks. Here's the Mets designated hitter. Butch Husky getting back into the lineup as the Mets have have and are struggling through a period of time this season where they've got some key injuries one down two on. And that one foul tipped the off speed pitch off the bat of Butch Husky. I think the one thing if you're working a guy like Husky first time here at Yankee Stadium one reason to pitch him inside it's not necessarily that he's vulnerable there but it's deeper to left field and the left center of course down the line only 318 here but that prevents Husky from extending those big arms and using the short right field porch by pitching him inside. One thing that hasn't changed here at Yankee Stadium through all the changes over these many great years here are the short porches. Mm -hmm. They've virtually always been the same, burying a few feet, but that's all. The rest of the dimensions have changed considerably. And Huskies, he's got a base hit right center field. John Olerud will score. Paul O'Neill up with it. That'll hold Hundley at third, and the Mets have a 2 0 lead. They are jumping on Andy Pettit here in the first inning. One interesting thing about this game you're going to hear cheering all night. If the Yankees do something well the decibel level will go up. Looked like Andy Pettit tried to come inside to Butch Husky once again look at Girardi and this ball not quite in far enough inside part of the plate instead of inside corner. Olerud scores easily. And Hunley to third. Husky's got his 35th run batted in and Carl Everett stands in Everett who's been red hot at the plate eight hits in his last 13 times up has the highest batting average in the National League over the last 10 days. However in this game he's moved down in the order one Lance Johnson's back in the leadoff spot and two it's a left hander turning Carl around. Pettit has a magnificent pickoff move. You do not want to have your mind wandering at first base. 11 pickoffs last year led the majors. Runners at first and third, still only one down. Everett, who'd been hanging around that 200 mark the first two months, has upped it in a hurry of late. The 0 1 to him, and he down to third. Hayes over the bag, foul ball. Both the home plate umpire Tim Cheetah and Mike Everett the third base umpire on the sign. Bobby Valentine jumping up on that bottom step of the Mets dugout. He got a little excited because that was very very close. It's not where Hayes catches the ball and often the angle of the ground ball. You see how close that was but just foul by about two inches. A better look right here. Oh that was close but good, foul but foul good call both ways. At home and at third, they both had it. Count goes to two strikes on Kyle Everett. Andy Pettit looking for the K here with two on. And he got him picked off. Now you got the runner at third, Todd Hundley, watching all this. The run back. Here comes Hundley to the plate. Right, he's got to cover, but I don't think he got him. He didn't. Hundley with a great hook slide. Did Husky intend to be caught off over there. I don't think so but it works anyway and the Mets lead three nothing. 
No, I do not think the Mets worked on this in spring training. <laughs> uh, Butch Husky was dead to rights at first base. Stunned. Watch this. No sense going back to first. Derek Jeter looking at third. Now the throw back to Martinez. The hard throw home is in time, but the hook slide by Hunley. He actually got by the left leg of Joe Girardi. A brilliant slide. Catcher going into a catcher. That's as good a hook slide as you'll ever see. And normally that's the worst slide into a catcher. However, what Hunley did, he got by the front leg. Watch. And he man. did it intentionally, Timmy. Man, that's he a was good watching spot. Girardi's foot. He knew right where his foot was and went around it. Great play by Hundley, and then he called himself safe, and he was right on all counts. It's the honor system. <laughs> Three old lead. Kyle Everett foul tips it, and it remains a two strike count on Everett. Isn't that the honor system? If you think you're safe, hey, give the guy an honest call. That didn't work you're when safe. you were 10. <laughs> no, it and didn't. And it doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with my honor either. No, no or, or any of, or you for that matter. <laughs> You were always safe when you <laughs> slid in when you were playing out there in the dirt. Thought so. That's right. It was an honest mistake sometimes, but it <laughs> was a mistake. One down. Huskies on at second base now. Everett battling here with the 0-2 count. Got its overhand off-speed pitch. Is foul back. He was some excited about playing, and he's just trying to cool down. Nimble footwork by Hunley. Man, that was pretty. See, he was safe. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love to see emotion in the game out of the players, and oh, Todd man. Huntley always gives you that. 0 oh, 2 by Andy Pettit again, and Everett's out. That one dropped off the table. First strikeout for Andy Pettit, and the second out here in the first inning of the Mets. That, by the way, is a caught stealing for Andy Pettit. Butch Husky going to second base and scored. One, three, six, three, two. It didn't develop. Had Hunley been out, that's the way it would have been scored. Ball changing hand five times. And handled perfectly, really, by the Yankees. They couldn't do much more except Girardi moving that foot out, maybe another foot. Carlos Baerga. Carlos four for his last 12 switch hitter. The other in the lineup besides Olerud, who has faced Andy Pettit before. Five for 15 on him. And Bayerga takes it outside for a ball. So the Mets jump out here in the first inning. Three runs, three hits. And uh, Todd Hundley playing a huge part in it here. He was as excited as any Met player about coming to play here at Yankee Stadium in this game. 1 0 delivery. Bayerga takes a strike on the outside corner. Only one man has ever hit. Two home runs in an inning, one from the left side, one from the right side. Carlos Baerga did it, and he did it against the Yankees. Steve Farr was the right handed pitcher. Steve Howe was the left hander. 1 1 chop towards second base, played there by Kelly. Pitcher's got a cover, and Pettit gets over there in time to get the out. So the Mets are retired, but not before they put up three runs on three hits in the first inning. Including this great play by Hundley coming in in that rundown. We'll be back after this. Mets right hander Dave Malicki will be making the start and actually has a record against the New York Yankees. His only career appearance, 4 2. He lost that ball game at Cleveland's Municipal Stadium back in 92 against New York. And the lineup for the Yankees reads like this Derek Jeter, the fine shortstop, leads it off. Pat Kelly at second base batting second Paul O'Neill the right fielder hitting third and in the cleanup slot the designated hitter Cecil Fielder Pino Martinez batting fifth Charlie Hayes the third baseman will hit sixth the switch hitting left fielder Mark Whitten batting seventh Chad Curtis is in there batting eighth and Joe Girardi ninth and the reason that Curtis is in there Bernie Williams with a pulled hamstring should be out for about a week. Not expected to play in this series. That's a real disappointment for baseball fans. Defensively behind Dave Malecki, Gilkey Johnson and Everett in the outfield. Franco Lopez, Bayerga, and Olerud in the infield. Todd Hundley doing the catching as battery mate. Right-hander, 28-year-old Dave Malecki. So Malecki's got three to work with as we go to the bottom of the first inning. And Derek Jeter leading it off. And the fastball up the middle is a base hit by Jeter. 
So the Yankee fans have something to talk about and an error on Johnson as he throws it back in. It got by Lance Johnson a single and an error. We go for Mayor Giuliani and his son. Was Mayor Giuliani kind of a Yankee fan? He's got to like this play. Rounded by Derek Jeter, and he gave himself every opportunity to get to second. He rounded the bag at first, running hard, and made it to second easily. An error on Lance Johnson. So Jeter, back in that leadoff spot, gets on, and Malicki now will work to Pat Kelly. And Kelly down to third. Franco holds Jeter at second. Over to Olerud, and Kelly's retired. And they are coming up first ball hitting off Dave Malicki. One down. Kelly does not get the runner advanced as he's back in at second base now. Getting some playing time after coming off the DL. You see two hitters come up that quickly. Timmy swinging away. Generally you got to believe the scouting report said something about it. I've got to tell you something about the scouting report. The funniest thing that happened to me today is that the hitter coming up right now. Paul O'Neill, known him very well since his Cincinnati Reds days, comes up to me and he said, can you tell me anything about the Mets pitchers and what they throw? <laughs> I said, don't you guys have scouting reports? He said, yeah, but, you know, I looked at some of them, but I don't know. Thought you might know since you follow the team. <laughs> Any edge will do. Not bad. Paul O'Neill takes the pitch for a strike. Now, there is a question that truly challenges your neutrality as a broadcaster. Well, that's, right. that's right. I mean, you know, well, yeah, I guess I could tell you some things, but I mean, well, I'm not know, gonna. what am I, I going to do? I, I can't do that. Come on. One strike count and Malicki with a fastball and that one misses outside one and one on Paul O'Neill. I don't know what you have to say much to Paul O'Neill about hitting. 302 last year, 283 career hitter every year. Just seems to get a little bit better. Really a solid player, isn't yeah. he? And always has been. Nothing's really changed. Massive crowd here. Strike on the outside corner. One ball, two strikes. Tim Cheetah, the umpire, got a hard look see from Paul O'Neill after the called strike. Bobby Valentine and Bob Apodaca, the pitching coach on the right. Bobby's great story of course that he's been asked about here for the last week and the last two days in particular is the fact that the opposing manager once released him as a player 20 years ago uh, in spring training that's yeah. right Joe Torrey one two count and the pitch is down low two and two on O'Neill I beg your pardon it was 1979 when Bobby Valentine was released in spring training he actually signed with the Mets when Joe Torrey was the manager. 20 years from yesterday. That was also the same day that Tom Seaver was traded to the Cincinnati Reds, 20th anniversary yesterday. Bobby said I was sure he was wrong then. Since then, I've had other opinions and have decided he was probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Swung out and missed, and Dave Malicki gets the strikeout against Paul O'Neill, two down. That looked like a splitter from Malicki. He has not been featuring that pitch that often this year, but watch how the ball tails down out of the strike zone. You could even see it to me. Yeah, out. you could. You got good movement on it. Mm -hmm. One first inning run in the 13 starts. Even though he has the 2 5 a record, he's pitched some good games, and O'Neill obviously did not talk to Timmy long enough. <laughs> Cecil Fielder <laughs> takes the pitch. For a strike call. Fielder, the designated hitter, 0 for 5 on the road trip in Florida. Numbers on the season. Slow start with a long ball for Cecil Fielder this season, but always dangerous. He still can drive it about as far as anybody in the game. He's got a runner at second base here, and Jeter with two down. That one, a high and inside. Broke back in, but not over the plate. 1 and 1. This season, left-handers hitting 264 off Malicki. Right-handers 270. Not much difference there. He's given up seven home runs, six of them to right-handers. He's pitched some consistently good baseball. 
One one breaking ball. That's what he tried to throw in the pitch before. This one he got in there. One and two. He throws us a fielder. On yeah, this. a lot of the, the reason that happens is a lot of times when a right-handed hitter sees that curveball coming, he thinks it's going to be outside. When it stays outside, he's frozen, and that's what happened to Fielder there. See what he gives him here with a one-two count. And he struck him out. Fastball. Good inning for Dave Malicki. After a leadoff single by Jeter, he gets a couple of strikeouts after one the Mets have. The three-nothing lead. Back after this from Audi. Dave Malicki striking out Cecil Fielder, and when a pitcher throws a breaking ball to get to two strikes, what it does, it slows down the hitter's bat from a mental standpoint. The curveball, now the count one and two, and the fastball gets Fielder. You can see it's a feel he was feeling for the ball away. But that curveball to get to two strikes slows the bat down. Good piece of pitching by Malicki. Great location on those. Andy Pettit goes back to work. Our crack crew here. I asked how many first inning runs had come off Andy Pettit. In 14 previous starts, he had given up only four first inning runs. The Mets almost equaled that with three in the first inning. Wow. And have the three nothing lead. Matt Franco making the start at third base leading it off here. Franco Lopez in the top of the order Lance Johnson do up for the Mets. Three for his last ten center field deep. Curtis back with Rome. And Franco is retired. One away. We should note the Mets made some moves today as they activated Lance Johnson. They outrighted pitcher Barry Manuel and placed infielder Sean Gilbert on the disabled list. Joe McElvain, Steve Phillips, GM and assistant GM. There's Nelson Doubleday, the owner, co owner on the left side there. Swung out and missed by Lopez, the shortstop, one for his last nine. So Manuel outrighted Gilbert on the DL with a staff infection in his knee. They put Andy Tomberlin from the 50 to the 60 day DL to make room for Jason Hartke who has been called up from Norfolk and is available tonight. That one hit him. And Lopez hit by a pitch. Will get down to first. Edgardo Alfonso still not ready to play. Hopes that maybe by the end of this week or the weekend he'll be back in the Mets lineup. Thing about how much of a surprise it is, the Mets on top three nothing. Butch Husky with a strained hamstring. Same with Alfonso. Ray Ardonias out until after the All-Star break with a broken left hand. Manny Alexander operated on. Almost. He's already had one that he's picked off over there, even though it ended up as a caught stealing when he got husky. When you're a base runner at first base against Pettit, you ought to play like they do in softball. Just stay on the base until he throws the ball. It should be <laughs> much safer that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Grounded out his first time up. Did Johnson throw back over? And Lopez again back. What? Bobby Valentine said he would not change any strategy that he would normally use in a game that he knows of coming into this. Not going to use the stealing game in this game against Pettit, but you may hit and run. And that one to center field. Curtis. Lance Johnson is retired, and there are two down in the second. Oh for two for Johnson. You mentioned Gary earlier that Andy Pettit with an inclination to throw a lot of ground balls. Mm -hmm. A guy with a good move to first who throws a lot of ground balls. That's why you, you don't give up your running game. You don't just start being passive. What you do you change your running game from a stolen base game to a hit and run game. Armando Reynoso. Got a been, lollipop. Look at that. Just enjoying it. If he was out there, we'd never get the game done with these two guys if anybody got on. They throw to first more than anyone else in baseball because they're so good at it. Right. Reynoso starts tomorrow against David Wells tomorrow night. And the third game will have Rick Reed and former Met David Cohn on Wednesday afternoon. Tomorrow night's game is a sellout. There are still some tickets available, though, for the Wednesday afternoon game. Two down here. Runner on at first base. Bernard Gilkey a double and scored his first time up. Already out to get that one ball one. There's the former Met David Cohn. He can't wait to make his start. He's seven and three with a two two one earned run average. Nineteen and three in nineteen eighty eight for the Mets. Boy did he give them some solid years. 
and has come back with the Yankees and doing the same. He's second only to Roger Clemens in earned run average coming into today's play. So David Cohn will be a formidable opponent on Wednesday for the Mets. One of the reasons David wanted to re-sign with the Yankees, he wanted to get rid of that label as gunslinger. And he has found a home here in the house that Ruth built. And loves it. 2-0 delivery to Gilkey. And Andy Pettit misses up high. Pettit's having a lot of firsts tonight. Those runs in the first inning, more than he's given up in a game. First hit batter. He's already walked one. He's falling behind hitters, which he doesn't do very often. Bernard Gilkey with that shoulder getting better. Inside pitch popped up right field. Paul O'Neill moves under it and puts it away, and the Mets are retired here in the second inning. Going to the bottom half of it. That's late at three nothing. Back after this from Budweiser. We're talking about what a beautiful day it was in New York, and an equally magnificent night. Great sunset, looking out over part of the skyline of the city in the Bronx. Mets with a three nothing lead, putting him on in the first inning against Andy Pettit. Yankee Stadium opening, of course, with Babe Ruth's home run back in 1923. Told you those lines, 314 down that line. I was looking today to see what the original Yankee Stadium was. I couldn't believe it was even shorter. Babe Ruth started here and built this house. It was only 301 down the left and 296 down the right field line. Out there in center field, the monuments and the plaques of the great Yankees. Tino Martinez, first ball hitting again. Right to second base, Carlos Baerga. Martinez is 0 for his last 10, is retired here in the second. Today's Mets game brought to you by Brewery Fresh Budweiser, who reminds you that fresh beer tastes better for that crisp, plain taste. You won't find it any other beer. This Bud's for you. One away. Charlie Hayes will stand in. Joe Torre staying before the game. Uh, my decision to start Hayes was one of the few times where I actually looked at the numbers. Charlie Hayes has batted against Dave Malecki. Six for nine against him in his career. So he said rather than have Wade out there at third base, play some Boggs. These two have been platooning, and will it work first time up? No. Hit it hard, Lance Johnson, two down. The Yankees aren't waiting, Timmy. That is the fourth out of six hitters, fourth hitter that has swung at the first pitch, three putting it in play. Charlie Hayes hits it well, but Lance Johnson's there. So Hayes retired quickly, two down here in the second inning, and that will bring Mark Witten to the plate, who's taking as much time as he can to get in in order to kind of slow it down a little bit as Malicki's not having to work very hard or very much early on this is down low with the ball there's a saying in baseball that you want long ends and short outs it means you want to stay on defense for a very short time and stay in the dugout for a long time pitchers love that don't they? Oh, do they ever <laughs> So does everybody else for that matter. There's Andy Pettit. Hoping to get a little more rest time here. Witten has not had a hit in his last eight times to the plate. Mark Witten, switch hitter, second base again. Carlos Baerda makes the play. He got him. So five Yankees coming up here in the first two innings, going after the first pitch. And it is a big one, two, three for Dave Malicki. Back after this from Mazda. New York Mets jumping out to the three nothing lead over the Yankees as we go to the third inning and Russ Salzburg our own WWOR Channel 9 sportsman joining us here Are you as excited as everybody else is I'll tell you what just being down on the field and talking to the players prior to the game uh, you know Todd Hundley said to me this is not like any other game you know uh, and I asked him if his father had played here he says nobody he played here I guess in the exhibition games so everybody's pretty pumped up what's going on tonight uh, you go from radio to television you take your sweater off and you're wearing a sport coat what's well, it you know, a little breeze in the air this is a special occasion Tim you got to dress up a little that's bit right. also with the, with the heavy rollers here you know, so. I like that I like that that's good good reason got to change the attire this is a good reason to change the attire and John Olerud leads it off here against Andy Pettit Olerud Hundley and Husky do up Olerud contributed an RBI double in his first time up as he picked up the first RBI here between these two New York teams breaking ball from Pettit is in there one ball one strike Russ I was driving uh, in today and I heard your take on uh, on Don Zimmer you were with the schmoozer and the sweater and the schmoozer on WFAN and uh, I thought that was an interesting take about why Don Zimmer got kicked out of yesterday's game 
and uh, and the thing that Greg Bonet said about well, to him. Well, to me, I, you know, I would think everybody would agree. The most important thing you're not supposed to bait. If anybody's going to do the baiting, the players or the managers or somebody might want to do that, but an ump is not supposed to do that. To be honest with you, I, I know uh, politically in this time of being politically correct, nobody should say you're uh, you must be on drugs. The horrible statement when taken when broken down. O'Neill over and makes a nice catch. Paul O'Neill and a hard shot by John Olerud hauls it in for the first out here in the third inning. Fine play by by O'Neill. The jump and the catch going to his left. Good play. You know what, Timmy? It's easy for us, all of us, to say. I mean, I, I'd be a real hypocrite because I know some of the stuff we say on the air, especially on the radio, uh, to say you should never say that. I think so, at some time or another, we've all made that remark. What are you? You must be crazy. You must be on drugs. Must be drinking right. or something now, like no, that. Knowing Zim, because Zim comes from a different era. You know, Zim's 67 years old. I bet you if the um said, what are you, stew to the eyeballs or something, he might not have appreciated it, but I think he would have taken less offense to the drug remark. However, I don't think an um should ever bait a player coach or manager all right it's, it's very difficult for a a person in a position of authority like an umpire to make a comment like that but consistent with what we're seeing more of and that's the abrasive immediate relaxations of umpires right to players and managers and yep. others around the game mm -hmm. which I think is kind of sad I do too I mean the the time of some acquiescence and some give and I mean, Zimmer came out to argue balls and strikes. That's that's all. It's mm -hmm. part of the he game. He was run from the game. He was when run he came from the out, game. Right? He was out. Should have been. But as Russ says, to have a comment beyond that yeah. from an umpire. Yeah. Todd would, Hadley's on with a walk. I remember one time in Toronto, uh, Steve Palermo followed Dave Steve for the Blue Jays. I think it was Dave Steve from the Blue Jays into the dugout, and we all thought at the time what Steve was doing was wrong. But for an ump to go right after the, it's it's crossing a yeah, line. You right. can't you can't do that. You're right. Todd Hudley's on with his second walk. He continues to pile them up. Third most in the league now. He's got the only two walks off Andy Pettit here in the ball game. Todd scored in the first inning. And with one down, Butch Husky comes up. Husky had an RBI single his first time up. That's with a three-nothing lead off Andy Pettit who misses outside to him for ball one. I'll tell you, Husky put on a show in batting practice. Three straight pitches, bomb over the whiz sign and left, bomb over the whiz sign and right. Then he put one into Monument Park on three straight pitches. I thought nobody beats the whiz. <laughs> Sometimes you can get over and around it. And the breaking ball is in there for a strike. Which is one of those players who would like nothing more than to drive a ball out of Yankee Stadium here any direction, in batting practice or otherwise. Takes great pride in the long ball. And when you come to this park, obviously, sluggers think about the long ball. It has had a home here for a long time. 1 1 delivery, jammed him, fouled off by Cookie Rojas down at third. And uh, Andy Pettit ahead on the count here, ball in two strikes. Yeah, they are not known as the Bronx, Bronx Bunters, no. or the Bronx Hit and Runners, 23 world champions here, the, by far the most of any other ball club. Because they have been the Bronx Bombers. The running Yankees has never been a turn. No, no, no. One two count. Todd Huntley at first base. Andy Pettit, broken bat down to third. Hayes, second for one. Kelly the relay, and they turn two. So the double play will get Andy Pettit out of the inning despite the walk. The Mets maintain their three nothing lead back after this from Dodge. Back here at Yankee Stadium for the first meeting of the Mets and the Yankees. Mets got three in the first inning. Gary Thorne, Tim McCarver, and Ralph Kiner. Russ Salzberg joining us here in the in the booth. And we were talking between innings, Russ, about I mean the discussion seems pretty well to have been taken care of now that interleague play is underway that this is good for the game. I, I think everybody agrees you know we can get stuck on this purist business and I know you know Timmy uh, you're from the old school but we need to do things to get fans interested and I, I'll tell you one thing having two teams winning in this town builds up the baseball interest far more than one because when the season started. And the Mets started out at three and nine. There was not the buzz that there is now. You have two teams with similar records, and this this series counts for something because the Mets have a winning record. I think if the Mets had a poor record, people would not be quite as excited. And healthy change is certainly good for the game. If the change makes sense, and this certainly makes sense to me. Yep. 
Chad Curtis will be leading it off in his fourth game as a New York Yankee picked up Monday from Cleveland for David Weathers was not playing much because of an injury he's coming off the DL a sprained right thumb that he had had only 29 at bats with the Indians in 22 games Curtis now getting starting time with Williams out of there in center field with a tweak of the hammy that's going to keep him out probably for the rest of the week Curtis leading it off here for the Yankees Girardi batting ninth will follow and then Jeter top of the order against Malicki breaks his bat Franco over to Olerud and he's got the out Curtis retired right now it's Dave Malicki who's keeping the ball down on the ground I think he's a far, he's a pretty underrated pitcher you know he had some tough luck early on and uh, he's given the Mets yeah, I'd like to see what they're going to do when they get some of those arms back yeah, it's going to be interesting when Jason Isringhausen, Paul Wilson, Bill Pulsifer are ready to come back to the big leagues. If there's any question that at the beginning of the year, and, and now too, as Girardi goes after the first ball, right center field, that's going to fall in, base hit, and it's a gapper to the wall. Chased out over there by Lance Johnson and into second base with the first extra base hit for the Yankees. Joe Girardi with a double, their second hit off Malicki. You know, I was talking to Joe McIlvain, uh, Steve Phillips, around, around the batting cage uh, prior to uh, the game, and I was talking to them about the pitches coming back. Girardi slicing one in the gap. Johnson hops on it in a hurry to hold Girardi to second base. And Joe Mack felt that Pulse, Izzy, and Wilson uh, were, you know, further away than both, obviously, Harnish. He, he, he sounds as though we get, Harnish it depends upon how he feels mentally and as far as Derek Wallace goes which would be a big lift coming out of the bullpen he thinks we'll see Wallace in August and it'll strengthen the bullpen obviously when these people come back as Jeter takes the strike then you can get a Rick Reed and Dave Malicki back into the pen and middle relief and swing rolls where the Mets really do need some help it's been covered because their starters have gone so deep in games but it's starting to show up now. Or you could start Harnish in the bullpen mm -hmm. and move him into the starting rotation if he shows to be effective. Gives you some options. Uh -huh. Dave Malicki jamming Jeter who had a single his first time up. Runner at second base, one down. Yankees trying to get one on the board here. And Derek Jeter with the opportunity. Well, let me ask you a question, Timmy. Do you think any one of these starters deserves to be taken out, or does Pete or anybody else who comes back? have to win a starting spot again I, I think Pete would have to win a starting spot initially because initially it's just the newness of getting back on the mound I think his first three to five appearances will probably be in the bullpen of course that depends on whether the five one of the five starters if something happens now if Malicki gets lit up several times then you're probably more inclined to put a guy like Pete and there is Pete who looks terrific he's gained a lot of the weight that he lost back and the personality is yeah, back too. that's exactly right they will not rush him it'll be at his own pace Bomber met Doc Gooden back on the mound of course for the Yankees for the Florida series throwing the ball well stunned that he was back so early along with everybody else one two breaking ball and a good one Wow Dave Malicki bends that one in and Jeter becomes Malicki's third strikeout victim. We saw Malicki earlier lock Cecil Fielder with that 1-1 one -one curve and this one a similar pitch gets Derek Jeter. Dave Malicki has the best curveball on the staff. It's a matter of controlling it and corralling it. If he throws that curve for a strike he is deadly. He has got it going right now yes. in the first three innings of this ball game. Yankees with two down now and Girardi still out there at second base Pat Kelly grounded out his first time up and the fastball misses up high there. You know we, we had that picture of Doc Gooden before when I asked Doc how he felt about playing the Mets he said this series would have meant more to him had it been going back to Shea Stadium the scene of so many triumphs for Doc. A remarkable year in 1985 24 and 4. Outside of first base over the dugout there'll be no play on that one. A lot sure has happened between now and then would you say. Well there was no question at the time. Uh, those of us covering the Mets at that time looked at his career and said what is this going to look like when it's said and done. The numbers that you could imagine when he was pitching that well were 
unimaginable. And then the whole thing caved in. And now it's a, a comeback for him. Try and get back to a regular starting role here with the Yankees. He certainly could use the good doctor being effective. One ball, one strike count on Kelly. Malicki working here with Girardi on at second base. And a two down, Mets up 3 nothing. There's that breaking ball again. Got it in there. One ball, two strikes. I'll tell you what, he's pitching with a lot of confidence right now. He is uh, probably tailor made actually to start this game because you talk about a heart rate that doesn't vary very much. Yeah, that's true. Dave Malicki is one of those. He'll pitch this game as he would any other. It's one of the reasons Bob Apodaca, the pitching coach, likes Malicki's presence. There it is again, and that didn't miss by much. He is really freezing the Yankee hitters with that breaking ball. Yeah, you know, they're not swinging and missing. They're taking the pitch. That gives you an idea of how they're locking. When that front knee bends, that's that jelly leg right there that Ralph calls. There it is. 2-2 Two -two delivery. Fastball. Miss. They want to check, see if he went. He did not. Don Dinkinger down at first. And it's 3-2. and two. Boy, talk about going from hero to goat last night uh, for Pat Kelly with the triple to uh, put in the go ahead run, then the ball between the legs on a perfect double play ball. Kelly trying to get his playing time back here at second base for the Yankees. 3 2, 2 down, and the breaking ball is a called strike three. And Kelly knew it. Four strikeouts for Dave Malicki. Russ, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it, guys. We'll you're, talk to you later. I got, we're doing a whole show from uh, here uh, on the field. We'll, Not only that, UPN 9 News following our telecast tonight. You, you got to be on the field with all the information. Did I do that right? You got it. All right, baby. UPN 9. New York Mets with a 3 0 lead back here at Yankee Stadium for this interleague New York matchup. And I have to ask Ralph Kiner. The one memory most prevalent in your mind when you come back to Yankee Stadium? Walking on the field for the first time. You just get overwhelmed with the thought that Babe Ruth played here and Lou Gehrig and that. There's Dave Malecki and that great 3 2 curveball. He's freezing him, Ralph. Wow. What a pitch. That's the one thing that Bob Apodeck has really tried to ingrain in the pitchers to throw the pitches that are not expected the 3 2 curveball, the 2 0 curveball. And then use the fastball as a surprise pitch. So Bob Apodaca is certainly doing a fine job as the pitching coach for the New York Mets. First pitch is ball one. And now the pitch back by Pettit for ball two. Carl Everett, the batter, Carl struck out his first time up and went down swinging at a curveball. Andy Pettit working for the New York Yankees, and this one has popped up and playable. Tino Martinez puts it away, one away. Mets broke out with three runs in the first inning with one man out, a blue double by Gilkey, then a solid double by Olagru to score Gilkey. Todd Huntley worked out a walk, and then Husky singled in another run. And then the Mets, on a pickoff play, ended up with a double steal in the third run of the ball game. You wonder, Ralph, whether Andy Pettit's having a bit of a problem tonight because he is such a ground ball pitcher, as you mentioned, yet he's only had three ground balls so far. And the Mets are getting the ball up in the air against him, which normally doesn't happen with Andy Pettit. He certainly has not got the ground ball so far in this ball game as Everett goes back to the bench. Robson, the hitting coach of the New York Mets, there's the ground ball. And the throw to first base for the second out is Carlos Baerga. Grounds out for the second time. Bayerga has seen a lot of action relatively against Andy Pettit. He had been five for 15 against him in his major American League career. So now two quick outs, and that'll bring up Matt Franco, the third baseman. Franco lined out the deep center field. And Franco goes after the pitch out of the strike zone at strike one. Franco against left hand pitching one for nine so far this year with a mix. And a good breaking ball there. Strike two. 
Yanks with a record of 37 and 29. The Mets have a record of 36 and 30. And now the curveball fouled off the end of the bat. So the count stays at strike two. Saw those players, nine players, Ralph. You remember that the Joe Torre had the unusual situation of playing for the Mets and managing as a player manager at the end of his playing career. And the pitch back at two strikes is taken, and it's strike three. Yeah, Joe Torre's first move as a manager of the Mets was to bench himself. <laughs> so a one, two, three inning the score. At the end of three and a half innings, it's the Mets three, the Yankees nothing. Here's a word from Bell Atlantic. Bottom half of the fourth inning, the Mets leading three nothing. The Yankees coming up against Dave Malecki. Lucky has been reached for just two hits in this ball game. He has struck out four. And he'll be working to the heart of the betting order. It will be Paul O'Neill, Cecil Fielder, and then Tino Martinez. Paul O'Neill struck out at a fastball, one down swinging his first time up with a runner in scoring position. He's hitting 389 with runners in scoring position. That was before his first at bat here tonight. O'Neill, the big power man for the Yankees. He takes a fastball for ball one. Rather surprising. He's hitting 100 points lower here at home than he is on the road this season. Paul O'Neill always loved hitting here at Yankee Stadium. At that nice short right field fence. And this one hit hard down to second. Knocked down by Bayerga. He has plenty of time. And he gets the out at first base. So the leadoff batter Paul O'Neill retired and that'll bring up Cecil Fielder. Cecil also struck out with a runner in scoring position his first time up that was in the first inning. Pretty busy night for Carlos Baerga so far. And here's our nobody beats a whiz scoreboard in the National League and the American League mixed games of course throughout baseball. And the first pitch, a fastball low for ball one. And here's the rest of the games on our Toyota scoreboard. Cubs and White Sox, that's a big one. One ball, no strikes. Malecki back with a fastball. It's rifled down the right field line. It'll be a base hit. And the throw to second base is just offline, or Cecil Fielder might have been out. The rocket throw by Everett. A shade offline and Cecil Fielder with a two base hit. You get some great rebounds off the walls in the corners here at Yankee Stadium. Well played by Carl Everett. Obviously not familiar with the field but Cecil really rocketed this. And it had a lot on it when it took a hop off the wall. Went for the pitch that was down and away. Watch this baby come back right here. That gave Carl Everett an opportunity. At second base, but Cecil Fielder went in standing up throw, as Ralph said, off the mark. Cecil Fielder, not overly fast to say the least. He had two stolen bases in last year's season, the first two in his major league career. Now the batter will be Martinez, and he takes a fastball for ball one. Tito Martinez granted out to the second baseman by Erga his first time up. Hits are all even now, three apiece. The Mets leading by a score of three nothing. We're in the bottom half of the fourth inning, and a topper out to the third base side, picked up by Franco, will throw to first base in time, and Fielder holds at second base on the play. So what Martinez an out. And out. What an outstanding play by Matt Franco. It would have been a good play anyway, but Dave Malicki got in front of him. Malicki tried to make a play on this ball, so Franco was blinded here, coming in having to make this pickup, and didn't have a lot of time to get the throw. Malicki thought he was going to make a play right there, went under his glove. Franco now has got a barehanded, good, strong throw. Nice play by Matt Franco at third. Filling in for Edgardo, Alfonso, and Fielder just watching that play. As we mentioned, he doesn't have that kind of speed to cross over. And wisely stays at second base. Now with two men out, the batter will be Charlie Hayes. Matt Franco has made just one error at third base.
Charlie Hayes flight out to center field his first time up and he takes a high fastball for ball one. Interesting Ralph Bobby Valentine was asked today how much the defense has played a part in the Mets position this year being six games above 500 he said everything all the difference in the world keeps our pitchers out there fewer pitches thrown innings that are shortened good example right there in yeah. the play by Matt Franco and that's ball two two balls and no strike to Charlie Hayes Hayes playing third base and a good reason for it the figure game Joe Torrey looking at the figures of Charlie Hayes against Dave Malecki he was six for nine against Malecki that'll get you in a game so he is playing third base even though he's a right hand batter against the right hand pitcher and that pitch is outside it's ball three three balls and no strikes Wade Boggs continues to struggle this season at the plate incredibly with a 255 average so that also has increased the playing time for Charlie Hayes in a pretty much platoon situation down there now three and oh Hayes could be hitting here they Yankees trailing three nothing he takes a strike for strike one three balls and one strike runner in scoring position Hayes hitting 156 with runners in scoring position good opportunity now with the count of three and one opportunity for Charlie Hayes and the three one delivery. It's a breaking ball in there for a called strike and another good pitch when the count was against the pitcher a breaking ball at three and one Hayes frozen there looking for the fastball. We could uh, pile up the jelly legs for you tonight Ralph. How many times have we seen this already in this game. That off speed pitch that just freezes the hitters. Add three two. And the pitch to the plate hit. Out to second base, a little looper, and it's caught by Carlos Baergan again. A runner left in scoring position. The score at the end of four. It's the Mets three, the Yankees nothing. Full house here at Yankee Stadium for the first official meeting in the regular season between the Mets and Yankees, and almost a full moon. And the first pitch here in the top of the fifth inning by Andy Pettit, taken for strike one. Luis Lopez the batter he was hit by a pitch ball his first time up he chops this one over toward third it's fielded nicely by Charlie Hayes and the veteran third baseman turns it into a good out. Outstanding defensive play by a Yankee team that has struggled defensively themselves this season fielding percentage wise this one though Hayes playing in has to cut it off. If he doesn't it's going to be a base hit he does and then you see that great strong arm after he gets over there and Hauls it in. He's got a cannon. And now the batter will be Lance Johnson for the Mets. He's 0 for 2 and he takes the first pitch, a breaking ball for a call strike. Johnson 0 for 2 and has returned from the disabled list. He's been on the DL since May the 2nd with shin splints. And he takes another breaking ball, strike two. He says he feels better now than he did at the start of the season when he was playing every day because he had those shin splints right from spring training on and tried to play through it and couldn't. And the fastball it is strike three so one two three for Andy Pettit who seems to be settling in. He has retired his last seven batters and that'll bring up Bernard Gilkey. Going to take Lance a while to get back into game condition as far as at the plate's concerned. First game since he went on the DL back in early May and now 0 for 3 and that brings up Bernard Gilkey. Gilkey with a check swing and a bloop double to lead off for the Mets in the first with the Mets first base hit after Johnson had grounded out. Gilkey later on scored in the double by Olerud. And now a strike one pitch and it's a fastball outside one ball and one strike. Gilkey's still trying to get that average going. They moved him into the second hole in the batting order, hoping that he would get better pitches to hit. He's at 205. And the off speed pitch bouncing away, two balls and one strike. Bernard Gilkey, fine left fielder for the New York Mets, a banner year last year. Career year as far as his stats were concerned, all the way around. 
and Pettit with the 2 1 delivery and it's inside three balls and one strike. Interesting in the game last night there was a situation where the Red Sox had the infield drawn in Gilkey on and Gilkey did not go on contact on the ground ball and they asked Bobby Valentine he said always the rule is you go on contact and a broken bat blooper in the center field for another hit for Bernard Gilkey. He is now two for three and the Mets have a base runner with two men out. He said what people forget and why Bernard didn't go is the ball was stung and it was caught and he said Gilkey just never had time to make a decision got frozen on it and that's why he didn't go and he said I didn't blame Bernard at all now on this one take a look here where this bat ends up base hit out into center field thought it might have caught the catcher Girardi on that but did not that jam got the base hit now is on at first base for John Olerud Olerud with a double now Gilkey picked off at first base and he'll be tagged out. So the base hit erased, the runner erased, and the Mets are out here in the top of the fifth. The score, the Mets three, the Yankees nothing. Here's a word from Veda Santa. Well, here in the bottom half of the fifth inning, the Yankees coming up. And Mark Witten will be the leadoff batter. He's batting seventh in the batting order. Of course, the DH in use here in the American League ballpark. Witten grounded out to second base his first time up. While playing for the St. Louis Cardinals back in 1993, Witten had four home runs in one ball game. Second game of a doubleheader against Cincinnati. And that tied the Major League record. He was a 12th batter to do that in Major League history. Drove in 13 runs in the doubleheader, also tying a Major League record. And Witten fouls this one off. Strike two. Good fastball there. Witten has never reached the potential that uh, so many believe and it's those kind of performances Ralph that have have generated interest for him wherever he's been there's always somebody that wants to pick up Mark Witten and hope that the potential can be consistent and it just hasn't been there yet. That'll get your attention four home runs in one yeah, ball game. It sure will. Two strikes the count. And it's in there. Strike three called, and again the breaking ball. Fifth strikeout for Dave Malecki. The important thing, well, the important thing for Dave Malecki is that he gets them any way they come, but we're seeing so many pitches taken. The last three strikeouts have all been called third strikes. And it's because of that great breaking ball he's got going tonight. You can bet Bob Apodak and talking with him has uh, confirmed stay with it. He's using it whether he's ahead or behind in the count. He's using that curveball as the out pitch tonight. And now the batter will be Chad Curtis, who grounded out to the third baseman his first time up, and he pops this one up. Shallow right center field. Husky making the call and the catch, so one pitch out right there for out number two. And give some credit to Todd Hundley. There's a great comeback. The Yankee guys are watching the breaking ball from Dave Malicki. So Hundley calls right after he used the breaking ball to get a call third strike for the Heat. Which puts the next hitter up generally waiting for the breaking ball so he's behind on the swing and ends up off the end of the bat popping it up. I don't think Todd gets enough credit sometimes for the call of games and the improvement he's made in that department this year. Unfortunately for Todd Hundley when he came up he got the reputation of not calling a good ball game but he has gone from that to being a very good defensive catcher. No swing on that call so it's ball one to Joe Girardi who doubled his first time up. Mets leading 3 0, bottom half of the fifth inning. Two men out. And this ball drilled in the left field. It'll be at least a base hit. Gilkey, who leads the league and assists, gets to it, fires the second. It's a good throw, and he got him. His tenth assist, and the ball was he didn't get him. That ball beat him. Everything beat him. And the second base umpire, John Shulock, says he didn't make the tag. Here's Bobby Valentine. Wow. He was there. The ball was there by three steps. Shulock saying, as Ralph said, the tag was not made. But that's one of those plays where generally you'll get the call even if you don't physically put the tag on because the throw's there so far in advance. What a great throw. That is perfect. 
had the glove down. Now you see it looked like he did hop over the glove. And in fact no physical contact made with that glove on Girardi coming in. Baerga pulled it away so he wouldn't get spiked. That's a tough call for the Mets. But technically Carlos thought he had him anyway. So the call goes to the Yankees and a runner non scoring position with two men out and Derek Jeter will be the batter. He has a base hit and two at bats and struck out once. Mets leading three nothing and a good curveball but out of the strike zone for ball one. Starting now with two doubles in this game he came in hitting 231. We now know the Olay play does not apply in this interleague game. <laughs> That's an unusual call when the ball beats you that much and the bag is covered by the glove. Little five ball to right field coming up on the ball is Everett. He makes the catch and the side retired. A base hit, one left, and the score at the end of five. The Mets three, the Yankees nothing. Here's a word from nobody beats the win. Well, Gunky didn't get the tenth assist, even though he made a perfect throw to second base. He's been picked off at first, and this is what they were talking about. Yeah, he wasn't concerned about the throw when he got back to the dugout. He was talking to Mookie Wilson about the pickoff move, Vandy Pettit, who's picked off two Mets. Mookie trying to show him what Pettit does and when you can get off and when you can't. How good a uh, pickoff has he got? Well, Gilkey was flabbergasted. And now it's John Olerud to lead it off here in the sixth, and on the first pitch, he bounces it right back to Pettit. So Pettit continues to keep in control of this ball game after giving up three runs in the first inning as he gets Olerud on one pitch. Olerud double in the first run of the game. Bernard talking to Mookie Wilson there before. Watch how big his eyes <laughs> get. Say, I couldn't believe it. I'm standing there and I just froze. I thought he was going to throw to the plate. <laughs> <laughs> he got picked off to end the inning. And now the batter. Todd Huntley and Todd takes the first pitch for ball one. Todd has walked on his two appearances. Now has 50 walks in the year. That's third in the National League. And Pettit's 1 0 pitch out of the strike zone. One ball and one strike. Todd against left hand pitching, batting 324, but only one home run. He has a total of 15, so 14 have come as a left hand batter. And he takes a fastball high. Two balls, one strike to Todd Huntley. Huntley at 294, 15 home runs, 44 runs batted in. And another one out of the strike zone, so it's a 3 1 count. Timmy and I were talking before the game about whether or not Todd Huntley might want to bat left handed against Andy Pettit. He does struggle getting left handers out. That's an amazing stat. Left hand batters hitting 375 against him. Yeah. And Todd goes after the fastball, fouls it back out of play. That would give Todd that short porch down the right field line to go after as a left handed hitter, which is, you mentioned Ralph, is where his power is anyway. But we don't see that happen very often that uh, guys take that track and will bat left handed against a left handed pitcher when they are a switch hitter. The 3 2 pitch on the way. And it is fouled off. So the count says a 3 and 2. Bobby Vadia, switch hitter, used to hit right handed against right hand knuckleball pitches. Mm -hmm. That's a different story. Though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it matters if it's in the middle difference. of the plate. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. You can stand in your head like. <laughs> And not be able to handle that knuckleball. A 3 2 pitch again, and it's in there. Strike three call. So Pettit comes back with a 3 2 breaking ball and picks up a strikeout as fourth in the ballgame. Pettit now with 71 strikeouts and 106 innings pitched as the K count goes up for Andy Pettit here at Yankee Stadium. Boy, has he settled in. And here's our new Dodge quiz for tonight's game. Who is the only player in Major League history to steal a base in four different decades? 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Well, we know one thing, it wasn't me. <laughs> and here's a ground ball 
through the infield by Butch Husky, who drove in a run his first time up, grounded into a double play, and now has a single. He's two for three for the night. Which decade did you miss, Ralph? 70s? 70s. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have Otherwise, might have had it. <laughs> How many did you have? I don't even know. Don't even know. But I, I think I got in double figures. Yeah. Usually on the back end of a double steal. It's all right. They all count. <laughs> Like the Mets scored on a double steal here today at a pickoff play. Mets leading three nothing, and the batter is Carl Everett, and the throw over to first base and Pettit with that good move. Butch Husky couldn't have been more than two steps away from the bag, and he still was leaning the wrong way. Well, that's Bernard Gilkey. He, <laughs> he made a believer out of him. Now Pettit to the plate. Everett taking for ball one. Everett has struck out. He also has popped to first. He hit well against left hand pitching. 323. His overall average at 256 coming into this game. Bernard probably agrees with Tim McCarver that the Mets should have softball rules when they're running the bases, at least at first. You can't leave the bag until, <laughs> until the pitcher ball. releases the ball. <laughs> Well, with Reynoso out there in the mound and Pettit, you got two of the best. Yeah. Reynoso well, will be pitching tomorrow for the Mets. Night game tomorrow. The Mets against the Yankees. David Wells pitching for the for the Yankees. Reynoso five and zero oh in the year. And Wells with a record of seven and three. And then Wednesday, the final game, it'll be Rick Reed for the Mets against David Cohn. Two and one the count to Carl Everett. Husky a short lead shortens up even more and the pitch back inside. So the cat goes to three and one. Everett is really crowding the plate on Andy Pettit. Started out in his first at bat when he puts the arms up he's almost out hanging out over the plate with his elbows. He is. Three one pitch and it's top foul so it'll go to three and two and the runner will be going with the next delivery. One thing about running on a 3 2 count, you've got to make sure, and the coach tells you this every time you're on first base, that the ball goes to the plate before you run. It's not like a steel play. Especially with Pettit. And Pettit you might even stand on the back. Three and two. That's leading three nothing. And that's all to first base. Let's keep playing it very cautiously. Back easily. Yankees with four hits. The Mets have five. The Mets winning three nothing. Twenty two stolen bases. I didn't know I had that many. Well, you've done well. Two decades. It's not quite the two. answer. <laughs> this way too. Not the answer to our Dodge quiz. But hey. A lot of people never had two decades. And you got eleven in each uh, in each one of the decades. I just about even them up. Yeah. I think I could have had eleven more in another decade. <laughs> Here's a 3 2 pitch, and it's popped up. It'll be playable in right center field. Going back is Pat Kelly, and he makes the play. That retires aside, one hit, one left. The score at the end of five and a half innings the Mets three, the Yankees nothing. Bottom half of the six, the Mets leading three nothing and three runs in the first inning. Dave Malecki on the mound for the Mets. Holding the Yankees to four, and here's the answer to our new Dodge quiz. Who is the only player in Major League history to steal a base in four different decades? The 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. And we give up. Can't figure out. Oh, Ted my gosh. Williams, how about that? 24 bases. I, he, got, he got me by two. It's your ratio is better, though. <laughs> <laughs> You certainly got that right. <laughs> Here we are, bottom half of the sixth. The Mets leading three nothing, and Malucky starts off with a curveball, and it's ball one. Pat Kelly, the batter. Kelly is 0 for two. He has grounded out, and he has struck out. Dave Malucky has given up four hits, and a good fastball there. One ball and one strike. Three of the hits have been two base hits and the other hit was a single that turned into a runner on second base with an error by the center fielder Lance Johnson. So all four of the batters who have got on base have ended up at second after hitting the ball. 
one one pitch and another thought about bunning it's one ball and two strikes and they've all been stranded there all four left on base for the Yankees at second base two of them coming with one out one of them coming with nobody out and one of them coming with two men out one ball two strikes Pat Kelly followed by Paul O'Neill crucial inning for the New York Mets bottom half of the sixth they lead three nothing and a ground ball pulled foul count stays at one ball and two strikes well, on this day in 1978 Tom Seaver pitched a no hit no run game against the St. Louis Cardinals. It's only no hitter. And uh, the Mets still looking for one of those. Clark the other night almost had a great performance. Reynoso also a bid for a no hitter. No Met pitcher has pitched a no hitter. Again, a foul ball. Seaver pitched his while pitching for the Cincinnati Reds, his only no hitter. He pitched five one hitters for the New York Mets, and of course, he did pitch for the Yankees. Yep. Doc Gooden, of course, did not get one with the Mets. Everybody believed. Uh, when he first came up he'd be the one and then came to the Yankees and lo and behold last year no hitter. But in that hat not a Met cap. And now the pitch fastball did he swing. Yes he did. So Pat Kelly struck out. First base umpire Don Dinkerin making the call at first base. Pat Kelly very unhappy thought he had held up when after a bad pitch out of the strike zone Dankinger though waiting for the home plate umpire to ask immediately signaled that he'd gone around on it. Take a look and see what you think. Did Kelly commit on this pitch and then pull back from it. Todd Humley immediately immediately asking for the call from the first base umpire and he got a good call. So Kelly back to the bench one away and. Paul O'Neill the batter he's 0 for 2 in the game and a fastball way outside. Yankees first played here in the new Yankee Stadium in 1923 before that they played their games in the polo grounds. In 1922 they played in the World Series against the Giants they got more publicity so John McGraw who was the Owner, part owner of the Giants, and also the manager of the Giants says, "Get out of here. Go get your own ballpark." <laughs> so they built the house that Ruth built, so to speak, Yankee Stadium. It was 1923 that they first played here. It's been a amazing history of Major League Baseball. Miller Huggins, the manager at that time, and in 1923 the Yankees won the American League championship. Played the New York Giants in a World Series here at Yankee Stadium. There are some of the monuments out in center field. Miller Huggins in the center, Ruth on the right side as you look at your screen, and Gehrig on the left side. And guess who hit the first home run in Yankee Stadium in the World Series? Casey Stengel. It won the game in the ninth inning. It was inside the park here at Yankee Stadium. And in the course of running the four Lanes all the way around. He lost his shoe. Kept on going. Always a showman. Three one the count. And it's ball four. And that puts a runner on with one man out as O'Neill works out to walk. First walk in the game by Malecki. And it'll bring up Cecil Fielder. Malecki well, thought uh, he might have had him on a pitch before as Malecki's been around the plate all night. Six strikeouts, seven is his high this season, came against Colorado. And the first walk, he has not hurt himself with the free passes here tonight. Fielder has struck out and doubled in his two at bats. And his first pitch, a breaking ball for ball one. Cecil hitting 265 this year, six home runs, 40 runs batted in. He has batted against Malecki before. And he is now one for five against Malecki with his double here tonight. And the fastball did he swing? This time, no. Well, it's two balls and no strikes. So the numbers at the stadium: the six home runs, three on the road, three at home for Cecil Fielder so far this season. He really had a struggle though getting the home run ball back this year. 
He's hit 295 home runs in his major league career. And the 2 0 pitch, good curveball. And again, throwing the pitch that was not expected. Cecil Fielder, I don't think, ever believed Dave Malicki would come back with that pitch again here in this sequence. He had missed with it the first time. And he set himself up for red on that one for a fastball and couldn't hold up on the curve. So the count two balls one strike and again a breaking ball and Cecil fooled completely. And it's two balls and two strikes. He's got them waving the last two pitches by Dave Malecki his bread and butter tonight. Two curve balls this one even further outside that's outside the strike zone. So two and two shortly the first base by O'Neill. And the curveball and it's pulled down the line but pull foul. So it's a long long strike. That curveball hung inside. Cecil still out in front of it. So he doesn't do any damage. The old hanger. You probably hit a few of those out of a few mm. stadiums Ralph. Just another <laughs> strike when it doesn't break. Uh uh. There it is. So the count stays at two and two. And the curveball gets him. Man. Seventh strikeout. The second time that Cecil Fielder had struck out. The movement spectacular right into the glove. You can see Todd Hundley by his head action going, oh yeah. You just tip your cap on those. Those are great pitches. A tremendous curveball as Dave Malicki's, as we've mentioned earlier, has always had that, but we've never seen him throw it as consistently as he is tonight, even as David Cohn shaking his head over there. And especially when he's been behind in the camp. And now he comes back with a fastball for ball one. Tino Martinez the batter. He has grounded out the two times he has been up. Batting 301 for the year, 21 home runs. 61 runs batted in. He's third in the American League in home runs, second in runs batted in, and second in multiple hit games. And he takes ball two, two balls and no strikes. One of the great ironies for Tino Martinez, he'll probably never make the All Star team in this league because he's got guys in front of him who get far more publicity than he will, but no better numbers. Came here from Seattle, a good fastball for a strike, two balls and one strike. He's got a home here. His contract runs through the year 2000. 271 yeah. lifetime better. I mean, he's just, he's a spectacular player. Clutch hitter. Now the 2 1 pitch, and it's popped up. It's playable. Carlos Baerga making the call. And the catch that retires the side. A walk one left to score at the end of six. The Mets three. The Yankees nothing. And here's a word from PSE and G. Well, the Mets leading three nothing, top of the seventh, and to clear up our Dodge quiz, we talked about decades, and Ted Williams stole bases in four different decades, and the example was 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Ted Williams played in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, which uh -huh. accounts for the four decades. Uh huh. 70s was just an example of what four different decades would be, and here's a man who played. In four different decades in his major league career, Tim McCarver. All right, Ralph. Thanks, Carlos Bayer. Got just a terrific ball game with the electricity that everybody expected, and the fastball from Andy Pettit on the outside corner. Bayerga has grounded a second twice, and Dave Malicki is three strikeouts away from his career high. He has seven on the evening, and he has just been brilliant. Change up, swing and a miss, nothing and two to Bayerga. Change up just misses. See G Girardi trying to bring that ball back over the plate. Girardi very, very good at that. One ball, two strikes to Carlos Baerga. 3 0 New York. Mets. 2 and 2 to Baerga. <laughs>
another grounder to second. So Baerga playing Pepper with the second baseman Pat Kelly, one out here in the seventh inning. The trade winds were pretty strong here tonight before the game. Matter of fact, Bob Watson in Joe Torrey's office, Joe Torrey, manager of the Yankees, and everyone surmised that the Yankees were talking about a possible trade of second baseman Mariano Duncan. As Matt Franco takes ball one, one and nothing to Franco, he's 0 for 2. The team that was talked about most prevalently was the San Diego Padres. So if you read about Duncan to the Padres tomorrow in your paper, as Franco rifles one by the diving Martinez, and that is hit number five for the Mets on the evening. Make that hit number six for the Mets. That'll bring up Luis Lopez, the shortstop, and here's the situation, Ralph, at uh, you may think about bunning even though there's one out because Lopez is not a strong hitter from the right side. He was hit by a pitch his first time up. So with Bobby Valentine, you don't ordinarily do that with a regular player. You might do it with a pitcher. But Lopez, uh, really the third choice as the shortstop with Ordonez and Alexander up. We'll see what Bobby Valentine does. Swinging away and hit a base hit to left field. So Lopez with a hit. Second time in this game that the Mets have had back to back hits the first time Bernard Gilkey on a check swing double in the first and then John Olerud driving him in with his 19th double of the year so the Mets threaten once again runners on at first and second and Lance Johnson who is 0 for 3 is the batter. Lance playing in his first game since coming off the DL he went on the DL May 2nd. Good play by Girardi. One ball, no strikes to Johnson. Outfield about straight away for Lance. Outside and low, two balls and no strikes. Anybody knows who has had shin splints, and anybody who's played baseball at one time or another has had shin splints. But realizing how long it was for Lance to be out, that's the surprising thing. Six weeks with shin splints. That's the longest I've ever heard of that injury healing. Outside corner, strike one, two and one. He got them in spring training and he continued to play in spring training. And he said that's what made it such a problem for him of getting rid of them. It was almost like the, the covering of the bone was pulled away so far it never did get a chance to go back to where it should be. Outside three balls and a strike to Johnson. The Mets lead it three to nothing. They scored all three runs in the first inning. They have runners on at first and second Lopez at first Matt Franco at second three and one to Johnson. Good cut at a fastball so the count is full. Interesting to see where, whether Bobby Valentine sends the runners here with Bernard Gilkey on deck. Well, the thing that's interesting, you pointed it out earlier, Tim, is the fact that left hand batters have hit 375 against Pettit. Unbelievable. That is just hard to believe. 329 last year. They are not running, and it's tapped in front of the plate. Pettit will go to first to get Johnson. Runners move up. Franco at third. Lopez at second. There are two outs, and Bernard Gilkey the batter. Now the Yankees have an option of putting Gilkey on and pitching to the left hand batter, Olerud. I doubt if they'll do it. Nah, I don't think so. They Not have with that option. Olerud a double in the first inning. You do have that option. Of course, Gilkey, two for three. Here's John on deck. I think you try to go at Gilkey with balls just off the plate here. We'll Tough see pitches. how. Yeah. See how Pettit works him. 
Change up just misses. One ball, no strikes. To Bernard Gilkey. Then if you fall behind two and zero or three and one or three and zero, then maybe you put him on. See how Joe Torrey, Joe Girardi, and Andy Pettit work Gilkey. Change up is down and in. Two balls and no strikes. Looks now like they, that's what Joe's talking right, about right yeah. now. That is the type of pitcher that if he misses, he can miss very close. He has fine control. And the breaking ball is high. Three balls and no strikes to Bernard Gilkey. And he didn't want to come in there. So that was the idea. Pettit walking Gilkey. Joe Torre not alarmed. One of the in interesting things about Joe Torre, you talked about, uh, you know, his managing the Mets and playing. Joe Torre had a chance to come to the New York Yankees in a trade in 1977. And if it was going to to cost him a chance to manage the Mets, he told Joe McDonald, then the general manager, I don't want to do it under those circumstances. Instead of going to the world champions, ultimately the Yankees won the world championship, and Joe was still a pretty good player. But he said, if it cost me a job to manage the Mets, I don't want to be traded. He wasn't, and he managed the Mets. Bases loaded, two outs, here's Olaru. Breaking ball is low. One ball, no strikes to John Olerud. Matt Franco is at third. Louis Lopez at second. Bernard Gilkey over at first. Two outs in the seventh. Three nothing. Mets on top. Base hit left field. Lopez will be sent home and he scores five to nothing Mets. Well, coming into this game, Olderwood against Andy Pettit was one for eight, but in this game, he has gotten two hits and he has driven in three runs. And the Mets have opened it up to five to nothing. Here's Ola Road going after the fastball, driving it by the shortstop Jeter. Left fielder Mark Witten, not a good arm here as he does throw it home, but at one time he had an arm that was like a cannon. Outfielders would die for his arm at one time. Five to nothing. Mets on top here in the seventh. Here's Hunley. Change up fouled off the right shin guard of Joe Girardi. John Olerud doubled in a run and scored a run in the first inning. And two RBIs here in the seventh. He now has 49 RBIs to lead the Mets. Big two out hit here in the seventh inning. Rounded foul. Nothing and two to Todd Hunley. This is the sixth day that Andy Pettit is working. A lot of people connected with the Yankees have said, and this is not a fact, tried to find out whether it was a fact today, but George Steinbrenner wanted Andy Pettit to open for the Mets tonight. Now, the, now by opening for the Mets, he doesn't pitch on his fifth day. He pitches on his sixth day. And uh, that could cause a very serious problem as far as the rhythm and timing. And sure enough, the Mets score three in the first inning tonight. Popped up right field and out of play. You get the feeling, Ralph, that if the Yankees lose tonight, Hideki Urabu might be in the bullpen tomorrow night. <laughs> he is the <laughs> Japanese pitcher signed by Steinbrenner for a lot of money. Big bucks coming over from Japan. Graham Lloyd warming for Joe Torrey's Yankees now. He's done well in his two appearances in the minor leagues and Mr. Steinbrenner is in Florida. I believe he watched him the other night. Yep. Down in Tampa. 
It's just a matter of time before the Japanese superstar arrives at Yankee Stadium. Still nothing and two to Todd Hundley. This one hit to left field, an easy play for Mark Witten. But the damage is done. A big two out hit by John Olerud. It is five to nothing Mets. Mayor Giuliani has uh, taken the Yankees to heart, especially since last year's World Championship. Joe Torre finally enjoying a World Series ring. Great story last year with his brother Frank. Heart transplant. Frank is doing well, we understand. And Joe proudly displays that World Series ring as Charlie Hayes leads it off for the Mets. Here in the bottom of the seventh with the Mets on top Dave Malicki has just been brilliant only four hits he has struck out seven and walked one and the breaking ball has been his friend tonight ball one to Hayes. I forgot to tell you that they have changed the scoring on the ball hit by Joe Girardi that was originally scored as a two base hit when uh, Viagra didn't make the tag at second. It has been reversed to a single and an error charge to Viagra on the throw from Gilkey. So Gilkey gets an assist in the play, his 10th assist of the year. He leads National League outfielders in that department. And Viagra gets an error and Giardi just gets a base hit. I think that uh, that was a good call because the ball beat him by several strides and Viagra missed the tag. I don't even think Carlos would argue about that. One and one to Hayes. Another one fouled out of play. That's interesting because now the Yankees have taken so many breaking balls they're fouling the other the fastball off the other way probably looking for that pitch. Well they got to guard against it because he's been so effective with his seven strikeouts with the curveball and that ties his high for this year for strikeouts. Breaking ball in the dirt two and two to Charlie Hayes. Check out our nobody beats the Wiz scoreboard. Cincinnati over Cleveland, an interstate rival. Phillies at Boston are tied. Florida over the Tigers in the eighth. The Braves over the Blue Jays. Roger Clemens started that game going after victory number 12. And our Toyota scoreboard. Boy, those Expos have won eight in a row. The Expos entered today's play three and a half games behind the Atlanta Braves. How about that? The game behind the Marlins. The Mets only five and a half back. Full count to Charlie Hayes. And the breaking ball is fought off, fouled away. First time in Malucky's career that we have seen him pitch for the New York Mets and he has been throwing breaking balls behind in the count. You mentioned it earlier. I think the influence of Bob Apodaca certainly showing up once again as it has all season with these Mets starters. This breaking ball is low, so Charlie Hayes draws a walk, only the second walk of the evening for Malicki. Now Apodaca talking to Valentine. Walked a batter in the last inning and a batter here in this inning, and pitching coaches really watch walks late in the ball game. It's an indication doesn't always mean that's true but it's an indication the pitcher might be getting tired. Bobby Jones who worked in last night's game picked up his third loss of the year and Mark Whitten on the first pitch pops it up. Carlos Baerga one out. That's something that I have never really understand understood Tim. After a walk and you're behind by five runs, why you want to swing at the first pitch? You want that pitcher to pitch some more. If he is tired, get more tired. Well, I'll tell you, a generation ago in baseball, that would have called for a fine. Joe Torre certainly not happy about that. I think one of the interesting things about the managers tonight, Joe Torre, an American League manager that spent most of his time managing in the National League. Bobby Valentine, an American, a national, 
National League manager, spending most of his time managing in the American League. Nice and switch. another first pitch by Chad Curtis. So after the 3 2 walk, and your point's well taken, Ralph, after the 3 2 walk, Witten and Curtis, with the Yankees trailing by five, both swung at the first pitch, two outs. And you can understand Witten because he has home run power. You can say, okay, well, maybe he might hit drill one out. Curtis is anything but a home run hitter. He should be trying to get on base. <laughs> this just in, Mike Lupica, the family news, <laughs> gave us a note between innings saying that. Irabo would not be in the bullpen tomorrow. He'll be starting tomorrow <laughs> if the Mets win tonight. <laughs> Joe Girardi the batter. <laughs> Nothing in one. Of course, it's well chronicled. I mean, George Steinbrenner taking these games very, very seriously because he took the Mayor's Trophy game seriously. So certainly an interleague game that counts on the record we mentioned earlier the rumor mail has it that Andy Pettit was moved back to the sixth day on the suggestion of George Steinbrenner of course the Mets took it seriously when they first played the Yankees here in Yankee Stadium in 1963 that's true they started their best pitcher in the exhibition game Carlton Woolley and Jay Hook was their next best pitcher and he pitched in that game the Mets won a six to two in the first meeting here at Yankee Stadium between the Mets and Yankees leadoff double by Jimmy Pearsall in that game Casey wanted to win it and if the Mets can get six more outs they'll win it on our Miller line scores five to nothing New York Mets and we'll return after this message. The only number retired by both the Yankees and the Mets, number 37, the dear man, Casey Stengel. And here he is accepting the mayor's trophy from then mayor Robert Wagner. Good to see you, Casey. And this is a great pleasure for me to present the mayor's trophy to you and the Mets for your victory over the Yankees in the game last summer for the benefit of Sandlot Baseball and all the youngsters of this city I know appreciate it very much. I have been in baseball over 50 years, accepted many gifts for playground committees, and I want to thank you, Mayor Wagner, that this is possibly for the Mets the biggest gift that I have to give for the ownership, for my players, in beating such a wonderful team, the Yankees. But I realize at my age, and the cities that I have attended, that this is the biggest thing that we feel that you've done this year for the youth of America. <laughs> Ben Scully had the best line about Casey. He said he will never die. And 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 with clips like that, you wouldn't think so. Graham Lloyd is the new pitcher, and Butch Husky fouls one off, nothing in one. Fantastic person, and of course, the first manager of the New York Mets, starting with the startup of the Mets in 1962. Slider ripped a great play by Charlie Hayes and he throws the first pick on the other end. What a play by Charlie Hayes. One out here in the eighth. Man. Well, Husky has had two hits in this game. They've both been hit hard. This was hit harder. And look at this play by Charlie Hayes playing third base. He was put into the lineup because he hit extremely well against Dave Malecki. But he's feeling even better. Husky robbed of a base hit. Wow. Good pick at first. Hayes actually catching that ball about two and a half feet behind him. Just a terrific play by Charlie Hayes and the numbers on Graham Lloyd. On one with a save and he has worked a total of 15 and third innings with the number run average of 2.93. One and nothing to Carl Everett. Carlo for three on the night. You know, when you think about it, that was one of the better, more clear uh, acceptance speeches by Casey Stinkel. One and one to Everett. You understood it, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. I well, mean, listening to some, you know, the test, 
when he testified in front of the Kapoffer, uh, Kapoffer committee back in 1954 and Mickey Mantle got up there and said I feel the same way as Casey. <laughs> Nobody ever said Casey. <laughs> part of that said well the Japanese will never make good major league ball players because they had short fingers. That was part of that speech. In that case he's been wrong. One ball two strikes to Carl Everett. This one hit deep to center field back is Curtis near the track and that's the hardest hit ball of the evening but Everett with nothing to show for it two away. That's Death Valley out there. It used to be even deeper in center field 463 feet I believe I remember correctly. Having played here you remember those distances and that has been shortened up that much. The old bleach area started with the back wall there so it has been shortened up considerably since the old days of Yankee Stadium before his remodel. Carlos Baerga outside from Lloyd. One ball no strikes to Baerga who has grounded the second three times this evening. He's 0 for 3. Two and nothing to buy Erica. Lloyd from Australia. Six foot seven. He's from down under, but throws over the top. Fly ball again to center field. And Graham Lloyd has a strong inning. But the Mets have had a strong night. It's five to nothing Mets. Back after this from Chase, Manhattan. Along with Ralph Kiner and Gary Thorne at packed Yankee Stadium over 55,000 here tonight. I'm Tim McCarver and as we said earlier Ralph it is a privilege to be here tonight. Another part of baseball history started right here tonight with the Mets and Yankees in regular season play. Another breaking ball by Maliki. Derek Jeter takes strike one. Derek is one for three on the night. The Yankees have only four hits on the evening. Two of them by Joe Girardi, their number nine hitter. Low ball one, one and one. back a ball and two strikes to Jeter with the exception of that long fly ball foul that Cecil Fielder hit on that hanging breaking hanging ball. Uh, the Yankees really have not hit balls hard tonight. Girardi had to single down the down the right field the double down the right field line. He singled the left field by Erga missed a tag at second. Fielder hit a double down the right field line. But the Yankees cannot figure out Maliki yet. One and two to Derek Jeter. Grounded to short. Lopez. High throw. Nice play. Olerud. One out. Lopez, the third shortstop the Mets have had to use this year, and so far he's done a very good job filling in for both both Ordonez and also Alexander. There is Ray Ordonez, who will be out another month or so. And Edgardo Alfonso, right to Ray's right. He played shortstop a lot this spring. And if he were healthy, he would be the starting shortstop. He lacks the range of Lopez and the others, but certainly is that a, a key contribution to the Mets this year as Pat Kelly takes the breaking ball outside. One and nothing to Kelly, who's 0 for 3 on the night. One and one. Alfonso playing shortstop would leave it open for Matt Franco to play third base and Franco with a hot bat. So you'd like to see that combination. Alfonso hitting at the 300 mark and out for a short period of time. At least the Mets hope that's true. Got that cast on the arm there. Swing and a miss at the breaking ball by Kelly. Maliki has gotten Pat two times tonight. Ordonia should be back after the All-Star break. How soon after the All-Star break remains to be seen. 
Low ball two, two and two to Pat Kelly. Tapped foul and off the foot of Pat Kelly, so. The Mets have seen their share of injuries with the middle infielders and Joe Torre and his crew hoping that that bug doesn't bite the Yankees. Well, Roger Clemens losing his second game of the year. Roger 11 and 2 and look at Denny Nagel a shutout for Nagel and the Braves as the first place Atlanta Braves in first place in the National League East beat the Blue Jays up at Sky Dome three nothing. That stops a four game losing streak for Atlanta. So a full count now to Pat Kelly that's right they lost three in a row to the Baltimore Orioles over the weekend. Strong Baltimore team I mean strong. Like Davey Johnson had in 1986. Hit hard by diving by Erga as Pat Kelly has a base hit. That's hit number five for the Yankees, and that'll bring up Paul O'Neill, the right fielder. Now Malecki working into the heart of the batting order, so he has McMichael up, Greg McMichael. As the Yankee power comes up here with Paul O'Neill as the first batter after the base hit. Bobby Valentine realizing that Dave Malicki has never pitched a complete game in the major leagues, nor a shutout. O'Neill fouls it away. As a matter of fact, I don't think in his professional career has Dave Malicki pitched a major league shutout. Check on that. He's never pitched a shutout in the major. Yeah, right. But I, I'm, I'm talking about minor leagues too. Minor leagues too. He has no shutouts in his professional career. Nothing in two now to Paul O'Neill. So this on this historic evening, this would uh, really be a tribute. To Dave Malicki, if he can hold on to the shutout and the complete game, but obviously Bobby Valentine not taking any chances with McMichael up. No balls, two strikes to O'Neill. Pat Kelly at first base here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Slider stays up, one and two now to Paul O'Neill. Another indication of a pitcher. Getting tired is when breaking balls stay up. Mm -hmm. It's when they open that body, the legs are tired. A lot of people think it's the arm that's tired, but usually it's a pitcher's legs. Line to left field. The breaking ball and Paul O'Neill right on it. So the Yankees with two on. The first time in this game that they have had two on in one inning. And that'll bring up Cecil Fielder, who can make this a two run game with one swing of the bat. O'Neill, an outstanding hitter, and especially against right hand pitching, really did hit a good breaking ball. The ball was down, and it was breaking sharply. And he went right with it and lined it in the left field. So this is just a good piece of good hitting. A little bit high, but not bad. That hit right down there on that high breaking ball.
One ball to Fielder. Malicki would like to make it 11. Inside, ball two, two and nothing. Right now he's in the danger zone with Cecil Fielder, a tremendously strong hitter. And Fielder with a count of two balls and no strikes. Slider tap toward third. Frank on a good play out in second. The ball hung up in the webbing. Otherwise, it's a double play. And Matt almost waited too long to go to second base. Had a tough time getting that ball out. It looked like he yeah. had a good shot at the double play with Cecil Fielder running. Good curveball there. And he makes the pickup and he tries to make the tag on the runner and almost loses the ball. Let's take a look at this again. He bobbled the ball and now he has it bobbled it again and then got it over to second to get the force play. So this is a double bobble. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like bubble gum, double bobble. You're right though, I mean that ball kept trickling around in his fingers. And he finally got the out. And there are two outs, but Tino Martinez the batter. Inside ball one. Matt Franco telling me before the game he has never seen Yankee Stadium, never been inside the house that Ruth built, and has always dreamed of it. High ball two. You hate a situation like that from a human standpoint for anybody to make an error in their first game at Yankee say, Stadium. This place is awesome when you come in here for the first time. It's intimidating. Two balls, no strikes to Tino Martinez. Two out in the eighth. Two and one to Tino. Playing a fastball on that 2 0 pitch and Tino behind it. Constantino Martinez. The regal name, isn't it? That is a great name. Tino Martinez remembering those days in Tampa. When he used to have to lift the tobacco, his grandfather owning a cigar company down in Tampa, Florida. Three balls and one strike. Martinez, in a recent article in Sports Illustrated, saying he got his work ethic from his grandfather and his father. Some of those hot, muggy days down in the toting that those cigar bales. Three and one to Martinez. Home run swing on that ball. He was thinking three run homer. You could see Hunley say down. You saw him push the mid down as Kelly stays at third and Fielder stays at first. He'll be running with a gap three two two outs. This is a big pitch right here. Nobody covering anyway. Now that isn't. Uh, you got to concentrate on the hitter here. You got a five-run lead. You can't be worried about anybody on the bases. You just got to really have your full concentration on what you're going to do in this spot. Time is called by home plate umpire Tim Tushita. There goes Fielder and this one lifted to right center field and playable Johnson with his left arm out catches it and that's the third out Dave Malicki a five nothing shutout through eight back after this from American Airlines. It looked like when Dave Malicki came into the Mets dugout Bob Apodaca approached him and asked him how he felt. We don't know that for sure but it looked like Dave said uh, fine. We'll see if he goes out there in the ninth inning. 
Edgardo Alfonso shaking his hand usually when that happens uh, it's an indication that he's through for the evening now Todd Hunley coming over to shake hands meanwhile the Mets lead five nothing here in the ninth Matt Franco who is one for three and a run scored takes ball one from Graham Lloyd the left hander. Not a save situation unlikely to see Franco and Franco no relation has his second hit of the ball game. Matt Franco leads it off here in the Mets ninth with a hit to center. What a job he's been doing He's two for four in this game batting against left hand pitching and he leads the major leagues in pinch hitting. So he's come off the bench he's been forced into the lineup and continuing his strong hitting. 11 for 23 is a pinch hitter. That's after going 0 for his first seven. Here's Louis Lopez, the shortstop. I think you've got to be bunting here, huh? Appears that's the case. And Graham Lloyd bobbles it, and Lopez is safe at first. It'll be scored a sacrifice and an error on Graham Lloyd. Well, he had a long way to lean down. He's six foot seven, but he sort of nonchalant at this. And he had plenty of time to make the play at first. And he sort of, look at this, one handed it, pounced on it, and it pounced away, and he can't get it to first base in time. So an error will be charged to the pitcher. He's got a lot of time. Runs out of room, however. Now the Mets with runners on first and second nobody out Lance Johnson the batter he's 0 for 4 and he wants to bunt he takes ball one low. If he bunts he'll try to bunt it to third. Draws the bat back ball two two and nothing. We mentioned at the beginning of a telecast that the last game played between two New York teams was at the Polo Grounds. The Giants beat the Dodgers three to two. Don Drysdale, the losing pitcher, that was on September 8, 1957. He wanted to hit. He takes ball three. In that game, Willie Mays hit his 20th triple of the season, and the reason that that's important is because Lance Johnson last year with 21 triples became the first National League player to have 20 or more triples since Mays had the 20 and 57. So Lopez is out at second base Johnson swinging on the 3 0 pitch. That's a bit of a surprise. Huh? Sure was a surprise because the walk would load the bases with one man out but yeah. they gave him a chance to hit away. And he gets a good pitch to hit. Makes pretty good contact, but he hasn't played since May 2nd. And the second baseman, Pat Kelly, turns the force at second base. No chance at all for the double play. Incidentally, in that ball game between the Giants and Dodgers, Hank Sauer had a home run. Hank Sauer had a home run. Junior Gilliam had a two run homer in that game. Hank Sauer was at that time 38 years old. Big Hank. One ball, no strikes now to Bernard Gilkey. Stayed with the Giants after being traded there from the Cubs. He had started his career in Cincinnati and then was the hitting instructor in the minor leagues for the Giants for many, many years. Outside, ball two to Gilkey. Bernard's just played a, a great ball game tonight. He is two for three with a walk. And his outfield play, as always, terrific. His 10th assist was registered tonight, even though he did not get the out. An error on Carlos Baerga on a hit by Joe Girardi, the catcher, and it's two and one now to Gilkey. Jim Masier now warming for the Yankees, the right handed screwballer. Graham Lloyd, of course, does not have near the move that Andy Pettit has. Few left-handers do, few if any. Pettit with a pickoff tonight. Two and two now to Bernard Gilkey. Five nothing Mets here in the ninth.
Joe Girardi giving the middle infielders signs that if the runner runs, this is what we're going to do, guys. Not running, and the slider is high. So three balls and two strikes now to Gilkey. And one would assume that Johnson will be off with this pitch with one out, three two. Got to bet on that. Franco at third, Johnson at first. There he goes, and this one lifted right side and out of play, so we'll do it again. Lance Johnson with those shin splints still isn't up to full speed. I imagine mentally he's very protective of those things because they are painful. Johnson gingerly goes to second again and another one fouled off. Yeah I think when you have shin splints and have the problems that Lance has you have a tendency to run on your heels a little bit more trying to cushion the blow of the foot to the ground. He said before the game and I was talking to him he either played on real squishy ground or hard. Well he's getting to work out that. Yeah you can see him. Uh, He's kind of going down there, those down there. Dogs are barking. Oh. <laughs> Still three and two to Gilkey. It looks like it hurts. Going again, and this is all Lance Johnson needs. Four foul balls by Bernard Gilkey. <laughs> Saying Bernard, put the ball in between the lines, will you? <laughs> this is probably what he did for about two weeks before making the active squad. That's right. Little short sprints like this. He's off again. And this one hit to left center field. That's deep enough to score the run. As Franco tagged, and he'll walk home to throw to second base, and the Mets lead it six to nothing. said at the beginning of the telecast that regardless of who won tonight there would be cheering. <laughs> it's an interesting breakdown. I would say most of the Yankee fans have left and these are Mets fans here but they couldn't all be Mets fans. Got to have the majority be Yankee fans. But there are a lot of Mets fans here. As you could tell after Gilkey hit the sack fly. Six to nothing. New York Mets on top. One ball and no strikes to John Olerud and the hit that broke the Yankees bat backs the bases loaded single in the seventh inning. This one lifted to right field and Paul O'Neill with an easy chance. Six to nothing Mets on top and we'll be back after this from Miller Light. It was a short trip for the Mets tonight as they just traveled from Shea Stadium to Yankee Stadium. Nothing and one to Charlie Hayes. And that ride back, you can bet that the Mets will enjoy that ride if things remain the same. Police That's escort it. coming in tonight. Now they had that police escort and they got it here in a hurry. Ground ball by Franco. Charlie Hayes will try for two. Gilkey with that good arm. Out at second base. Out at second base. One out here in the ninth. And what a bad base running play that is. Six runs down. And you know Gilkey can throw. He had an assist earlier in this ballgame on a perfect throw from left field. And now gets his 11th assist as he guns down Charlie Hayes and Joe Torrey. Not happy about that. Perfect play, right? Bernard Gilkey and the tag made by Bayerga, who earlier missed the tag and was charged an error on a throw from Gilkey. So bad baseball by the Yankees. Absolutely. You got to play one base at a time, especially in the ninth inning. You're trailing by six runs. Mark Whitten takes a fastball high. And he hits one 
to left field for a base hit. So two straight hits, but one out. Boy, that's just terrible base running by Charlie Hayes. Terrible. You just don't have your head in the ball game when you make plays like that because you're nope. down six nothing in the ninth inning. Remember, in 278 professional games, Dave Malicki does not have a complete game shutout. No shutouts in his pro career. 278 games. This is 279. Eight years in professional ball, and he could have it if he could shut the Yankees down here in the ninth inning. Chad Curtis the batter. He fouls it back. Nothing in one to Curtis. He has given up four hits in his last two innings of work. Breaking ball strike two to Curtis nothing and two to Chad Curtis with one on and one out here in the night the Mets on top six nothing on deck batter Joe Girardi breaking ball third base Franco to second to first not in time and Franco took too much time but in a way I think that might have been a good play because he wanted to make one sure absolutely you get the first man for sure you're not really thinking of the double play he takes his time makes a good accurate throw to second base and they lose a possible double play but you want to make one sure and now the Yankees are down to their last out. Joe Girardi the batter Girardi has two of the eight Yankee hits on the evening and the crowds on their feet ground ball base hit center field Girardi with his third hit of the night and that will quiet the Mets fans that are left temporarily. And be with us again on Thursday at 7.30 when the Mets return home and host the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> you can understand why, why that dude needs that back brace. <laughs> Two on, two out here in the night. Derek Jeter, the batter. Derek one for four on the night. Breaking ball and a beauty. Nothing in one to Jeter. Jeter let off the game with a base hit in his first pitch. Bob Apodaca hoping that on the last pitch of this game, Jeter goes one for five. Breaking ball, nice play, Hunley. One and one to Derek Jeter. I think that's why Bobby's leaving him in right now to give him a chance for the shutout, and then he'll bring McMichael in with a six-run lead. I think that uh, it could be a big confidence builder for him if he can get that complete game Good and if he can get that shutout. Yep. I mean there's something that something like that does to your your ego. Bows it back a ball and two strikes now to Jeter. Met fans on their feet once again. Oh there are a lot of Met fans here. Michael Green right there and Steve Peters. 
of the New York Mets. Well, we're not going to show that, but some unruly fan is on the field right now. We're hoping that this game could be played without interruptions like that. For the most part, the crowd has just been super. Excitement generated. They're both out around 3 34 o'clock today. Genuine enthusiasm. It has been a great day for Mets fans and a great day all the way around. Just outside. Jeter did not go. Says first base umpire Don Dinkinger. So the count two balls two strikes to Derek Jeter. His first complete game shutout. And Ralph, you're exactly right. What a boost to his self esteem. And he did it with the pitch that got him through this ball game in great style the curveball. The curveball, one of the best in baseball, and he was able to really use it tonight in that shutout 6 0. 